Okay. Again, this is the City of Ann Arbor Citizen Pruner Virtual Classroom Training. This is January 27, 2024. Today we're going to discuss uh, the class in classroom training where you're going to learn about all the basics of um, tree biology, pruning, and this specific program. And then our outdoor training practice day will be um, next weekend on February 3rd. And then at that point you'll sign up for hopefully at least one um, citizen pruner uh, workday and come and join us. Um, the next steps would be the for you to participate in those workdays. Um, and there are three of them to choose from. You can come to all three or you can choose one, whatever works best for you guys. And then after that, you start pruning. So you can take this back to your neighborhoods and and um, your, your properties, your trees, and hopefully keep the momentum going. So today's agenda, we're just going to, again, be the, the virtual classroom session. Um, we used to do these all in one day. And now we've split it up um, into two different days. So the Citizen Pruner Program began back in 2011. The goal was to really engage with our citizens to become stewards of our urban forest uh, by, by caring for the newly planted street and park trees. We've had so far 179 pruner volunteers who have pruned close to 2,300 trees. It's a really popular program and we're really proud of it. The tools and safety and equipment, um, we just want to acknowledge and thank the Elizabeth Dean Fund and the City of Ann Arbor Customer Service Improvement Grant. Um, that allowed us to purchase all the tools that will be used during our work days and training. So big thank you and shout out to them. So we're gonna talk about Ann Arbor's urban forests. Um, it's all of the publicly managed trees, including our natural areas. The city manages around 4,900 street trees, around 8,000 park trees, which would be considered the mowed areas, and then thousands of trees in our natural areas. And we have dedicated teams for each of those areas. We have our street tree inventory um, and park tree that is accessible to um, anybody. It's on the website. You can pull up information on the tree. You can type in your address and go see. Um, but we collect a lot of information on our street trees, including their condition, their what maintenance they need, their size, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we keep track. Um, we update it regularly as we do the work. And that you can, again, access the inventory. This is what it would look like if you were to um, go to the city's GIS page. You could pull up natural features and select the street tree inventory. Um, it would pull it up. You could just click on the tree and it'll tell you the species and the size and you can zoom right down to that tree. We do have an urban forest management plan that was first adopted in 2014. The plan just provides us um, recommendations and action steps uh, and priorities of work um, to sustain and grow our urban forest. And we are currently working on that and hope to get our new um, management plan um, updated completely and out this year in 2024. So just a breakdown um, of what we've done in the past fiscal year. So. Um, July 1, 2022 to June 30, 2023. We do everything by fiscal year here. Uh, we removed almost 700 trees. We pruned 10% uh, of our, roughly 10% of our urban forests, uh, 4,600 trees. We removed our, a bunch of stumps. We did, planted over a thousand trees. We target a thousand tree um, per year. And so we're, we're proud of that. We do have um, a private tree planting program through um, the Office of Sustainability and Innovations that sometimes plants trees on private and this year they didn't have funding for it so they didn't have any trees planted there. However, they were able to give away over 2200 seedlings for residents to plant on their, their property. And then forestry alone responded to uh, 2900 service requests and unfortunately, uh, a lot of those were storm requests this past year with the ice storms we had back in February and March of, of 2023. 
um, those were rough and really impacted our urban forest. So the number one maintenance need of our urban forest is pruning. Approximately 75% of the trees need routine pruning and a little over 17,000 require young tree pruning. So those are the ones that, that you guys will work on. Any of the, the large pruning that would require mechanized equipment like chainsaws, um, uh, bucket trucks, things like that, our staff handles. And you won't be asked to perform or use any of those tools. So really important to understand tree biology and exactly what, um, how the tree is going to potentially respond to what we're doing because we're essentially wounding the tree when we're pruning it. And we need to be careful and mindful um, and purposeful in what we do. So, you know, most people know trees need several things to um, succeed. And they're listed here, you know, water, air, light, nutrients. And of course, one we don't think about a lot is space. You know, we, we've tried cramming trees into um, the urban environment in very small growing conditions and then sometimes wonder why our trees struggle a little bit. And a lot of times it, it does come down to space. Of course, we have the parts of the trees, the leaves, trunks, branches, and roots. The roots, a lot of people don't think about it. It's not something they see a lot. It's under the ground, um, but it's it's really what makes the trees support and anchor itself. Um, it pulls water and nutrients and oxygen flow. People don't think that the roots are pulling in a lot of oxygen, but that's really why you can't add much. Uh, you can't change the grade over the root system because they'll lose that um, capacity and ability to do oxygen exchange. It stores carbohydrates and then it transports, helps transport that water and nutrients from the leaves, the canopy down through the roots back and forth. The roots will really grow anywhere there's adequate conditions. And I really like this graphic uh, from Trees Tree Pittsburgh because it shows the foundation of a house. And a lot of people are very concerned their trees are gonna destroy their foundation, but um, the trees are going to hit an object and then turn. The roots, they they aren't strong enough to, um, to penetrate. If there is an already existing or new existing issue with the foundation, yes, a root can get in there and make it worse, um, but they won't itself break a pipe or a foundation or anything like that. But again, they'll grow anywhere that there's adequate moisture, oxygen, the temperature's you know, good, and there are nutrients. Trunks and branches, they are really what conduct water and nutrients. They'll support the growth of the tree or the, excuse me, the leaves, which is critical in their whole way to survive with photosynthesis. And then they add strength. The trunk is basically the with the bark a defense against the outside world. The bark is like your skin; it keeps out bacteria, harmful things. The phloem, which is B there, that is the food transport system. So it lives for a very short time and then it turns into cork, which then becomes part of the bark. So the phloem becomes part of the bark. The cambium which is a living part of the tree. It produces new wood and bark annually. The xylem, or we call it sapwood, is moves the tree's water and nutrients. It's that transport system. And it's made of newly formed wood. That's D there. And then heartwood is the central support of the tree. The leaves, everyone has heard of photosynthesis. You know, it, it converts carbon dioxide into carbohydrates using energy from the sun. Um, the leaves also do respiration, which is a process that releases energy from food that's created from photosynthesis and transpiration. That's evaporation of water vapor through the leaves, from the leaves. They really do a lot. People really think of photosynthesis, but they, they do a lot for the tree. And then I always like to share this graphic, um, how to kill a tree. We keep this, we take it to different events that we go to. And a lot of times 
people really don't realize what they're doing is detrimental. Now, this graphic is, is a bit extreme, but if you think about it, that you know, the, the basket and the wire and the mesh underground, I see we see that people um leave the support ties on there way too long that end up girdling the trees and then just topping. Um, it's really they do a lot of different things. So they're always surprised when they realize they've been doing something that's harmful, but just a fun graphic. We find lots of new and inventive ways to kill trees. So it's important to remember that pruning is an art and a science, and it's really the skill is acquired through practice. And that's what you guys are gonna be doing um, next week is we're gonna go out, we're gonna practice, and then um, we'll go out and start pruning additional trees. <clears throat> so we're going to look at tree forms. The form of the tree is important to know kind of which way it's likely to grow so that we can make cuts to have it grow in the way we want, meaning deflect it either to put growth up and out of the walkway, um, or if we're trying to avoid other trees and prune around that, we really want to do a directional pruning. So we've got two different forms. We've got X current and D current. So X current is that strong central leader with a very pyramidal shape. Think of your pines and spruces, um, tulip tree, things like that. And then we have D current. So several to many lateral branches and they compete with the central dominance, very globe or spherical shape. Think your maples, um, most of the uh, deciduous trees. So here's, Examples of X current, that strong central leader. Again, conifers, which are the um, pines and firs and spruces, all of those. And then sweet gum and tulip trees. They have that very pyramidal growth. And then the D current, again, it's most hardwoods. They've got uh, the a lot of lateral branches that compete with the leader and most of the hardwoods. So again, maples, oaks, you know, elms, all of those, they just have that nice round shape. So the question is why do we prune trees? Um, one for us with the city really is safety and clearance. We need to make sure we're removing limbs that can pose a safety hazard along the sidewalk and roads. The reason we prune up so high on our trees is we have to get some pretty big um, vehicles through there. So think of the snow plows, the ambulance, you know, fire rescue, things like that have to be able to get through the road um, to whatever emergency they're going to safely um, without damaging their equipment and hopefully without damaging the trees. And then health and structure, we want to make sure that we're um, helping the tree to develop that strong structure, and remove any diseased limbs, really to prolong the life. Urban trees have a tough and we really want to give them the best support we can to have them live as long as possible. And then aesthetics. <clears throat> we always take aesthetics into account when we're pruning our trees. Uh, we want to make sure that they they look decent so that they have, you know, relatively balanced crown, um, that we're not doing anything that's um, going to make them look real funky, hopefully. Uh, just think about like DTE pruning. They're pruning for a very different reason for utilities clearance. And so they, they don't always think of uh, take into account what the tree is going to look like afterwards. Their main goal is that. So we try to take into account why we're pruning, so safety and clearance, health and structure, but then also take the time to make sure we're making the tree look as good as it can after what we've done. <clears throat> I love this out of trees, Pittsburgh. It's kind of a dramatic photo, you know, kind of campy, but it's true. People are looking down at their phones a lot and all of a sudden are running into things um, that they aren't paying attention to. And trees and branches are certainly that. Um, we need to make sure that we have the clearance for folks to walk under um, and anything that's near signs or traffic signals, we need to make sure those are clear for, for safety reasons. Health and structure, we want to again, make sure we're removing all of the dead and damaged broken limbs um, anything that's disease or insect infested uh, branches, and then anything that's crossing or rubbing that's going to um, cause problems down the line as the tree gets larger. So we really 
just want to make sure we have that strong structure to reduce damage that can be caused by severe weather. It can be caused by um, really anything. This is what happens when crossing and rubbing branches are not removed. You can see that they've they've grown together and now they're going to cause a big problem and likely cause that tree to fail a lot sooner than if we had taken care of that. Now, this isn't in our um, urban forest, but as an example, this is what can happen. And this is when the young tree uh, pruning, which is what you guys are going to help us with, helps prevent this. And it's why it's so important. We wanna look at the branch unions. Now, a U-shaped union is very strong. A V-shaped union is very weak. There's a lot of included bark that gets in there. And included bark is um, the area where you can see the seam where the two branches come together, there's a seam that comes down and that makes a very weak joint easy um, where decay fungi can get in there, but also where it can tear apart very easily. So again, at the forked branches, they're nearly the same size. When they were younger, one of them should have been taken. A decision should have been made. This will eventually lead to the failure of the tree. And this is the what it will eventually do, is it tears out right there. It's a very weak union. You can see the dark area that kind of dips in to that, um, the solid wood there. And that's just where decay fungus was in and made it weak. So pruning for aesthetics, we just want to enhance the natural form and character of the tree. And that's important, the natural form and character of the tree. So that's where it's important to know um, really what the shape of the tree wants to be versus what we're going to be doing to it. It's going to improve the beauty and improve the views. A lot of people um, have different views they want to look at, and so they'll elevate, but they still want the tree to look nice. You want to try to keep that form together. So here um, is a tree before it was pruned by our citizen pruners. It's on the left there. And then what it looks like after pruning by citizen pruners in our program. We got a lot rid of a lot of lower branches that were gonna cause problems. It looks like they got rid of some crossing branches that were up throughout the crown. <clears throat> Again, a before and after. With the before on the left, there are a lot of suckers growing up um, from the from the base of the tree there. Um, it didn't need a whole bunch of pruning in the crown, but they were able to clean it up some. It looks a lot better. So it's really important to understand a tree's response to pruning. So knowledge of a tree's natural characteristics will help guide proper pruning practice. So in this graphic, um, it's gonna explain coded. This coded is compartmentalization of decay in trees. This is how a tree responds to a wound. When we prune a tree, we wound it. Trees respond to the wound with a two-step process called compartmentalization. So the green is a decay organism. The red is the, step one is the formation of a boundary layer, making existing wood around the wood unsuitable for decay organisms. So the blue, which is the second step, the arrows here so you guys can see, so, so step one forms it into the wood so that the decay organism can't go there. Step two is a formation barrier of new wood that grows and stops it from spreading after wounding. We're going to go into this a bit more, but just know that there's the tree compartmentalizes to try to trap the, the decay organism from spreading. And it's how they respond. So here's a proper cut made on a tree on the left. In the center, there's a partial wound closure. So that's the tree responding and growing wound wood, what we call wound wood, over that injury 
and a complete closure, you can see in that third photo what it looks like, and it'll help stop any decay fungus from moving anywhere else and seals that off. Here's poor wound closure, and it's why it's really important to make the cuts properly. Um, it, it can, you can, if you leave a stub too long, the wound wood can't close over it. If you flush cut, which means right up against the trunk, you're cutting off the part of the tree that grows the wound wood, and it cannot, it doesn't have the ability to, to close over it. <clears throat> I know for a long time, wound dressing was, was recommended, um, but it's not now. We do know, you know that the tree produces that, that wound wood that covers the wounds and really accelerates um, closure. And it's, it, this, it hinders that and it makes it hard to do. So understanding a tree's response to pruning can lessen the amount of wounding and decay through proper pruning techniques. It's it's really, we're gonna hammer this home, especially when we're out um, actually pruning on the trees. We wanna make sure that we're making the cuts in the right spot. We'll practice this a lot. Um, and then we'll have um, trained folks um, kind of going around your groups to make sure that this is happening correctly. And you, of course, you can always skip a cut and wait until one of us is around um, if you have questions. So proper pruning techniques is um, two parts, the location of the pruning cut and then the, the method, the pruning method, how you're going to cut, what tool you're going to use. So with location of the cut, we're going to talk a lot about the, the branch bark ridge and the branch collar. You're going to want to make sure that when you are pruning, you're outside of the branch bark ridge and the branch collar. So you can see in the red dashed line, this is where the cut would be made. So location of pruning cuts. Here's the branch bark ridge. They're not always so pronounced. Here's the branch bark collar. It's the bulge on the bottom of the, of the branch on the trunk there. And here's the correct location, just outside of those areas. The branch bark ridge and the branch collar in that area where the cells are that form the wound wood. A lot of folks think going right up against the trunk, what we call a flush cut, is correct, but it's not. You're going to cut off the branch bark ridge and then into the branch bark collar or the branch collar, and that's not going to allow the tree to heal appropriately. So again, location of cut, there's the branch bark ridge. There's the collar. And when you're in the field, even if you can't see it, you can feel it. There are often times that I'll take my gloves off and feel the branch where it joins if I'm able to reach it. And you can feel the bulge of the ridge and the collar. And you know then where to place your cut. You know where to stay outside of. So again, there's your cut. Again, that would be the incorrect method. We wanna make sure to stay outside of those. Here are examples of some proper pruning cuts. You can see the ridge is still intact. You can see the bulge is still there. So let's look at the methods of pruning. If we're cutting a small branch versus if we're cutting a larger branch, smaller branches, obviously we can use um, smaller tools. We're gonna talk about the three cut method. Now, the three cut method is just what it sounds like. There are going to be three cuts. There's what we call a first cut or an undercut. There's a second cut, which is an, um, an, an overcut where you're gonna remove the branch. And then there will be a third final cut where you actually remove the branch. Now, what happens here is when you make that undercut, it prevents tearing. We want to, again, make sure that live tissue of anything we're going to leave behind 
is intact and unharmed. So that first cut, you can see in the second photo where it broke off at that cut, at that undercut. Now we'll come back and we'll remove the, the stump that's left. And that's that final cut. Now, if we hadn't done this undercut, when we did that second cut with, to remove the branch, it would have just torn down that stub and down in potentially into the trunk of the tree and torn that critical, um, the branch bark collar down there, the branch collar at the bottom, and it would leave a wound. And we'll look at what those wounds look like here in a, in a bit. So again, that first cut is the undercut. The second cut is past that. It doesn't have to be, there's no set, you know, it's gotta be five inches from the undercut. There's nothing like that. Just go past it several inches and make your second cut and then remove the stub that's left. You can see here, they're outside of the branch bark collar and the um, the ridge, sorry, the branch bark ridge and the collar. Again here, that's what it's gonna look like when you're making the undercut. And then the second cut, you can see he's not very far past his undercut. You don't have to, it can only be a few inches if you want it to be. And then that final cut to remove the stub. So anything on a branch that's, you know, two inches or larger, you're gonna wanna do this. If it's a thin bark species like a maple, you're probably gonna wanna do this for something that's um, an inch and a half. If, if you can't cut it straight through um, or use a smaller pruning instrument, you may wanna think about using the three cut method. So the three cut method prevents tearing. And here you can really see that where it started tearing when they were cutting and it broke off at that undercut and it stopped the tearing from going further. This is what happens or can happen if you don't use the three cut method for larger branches. Now that tree is going to do, those trees are gonna do their best um, to seal over. They're never gonna seal that over. It's damaged the tissue that grows and really opened up a large wound for decay, um, decay entities to get in there. So the cuts themselves, you can see this one has a stub, it's too long. We've got a flush cut, it's too close. Again, these are not going to heal over appropriately. And then what a proper pruning cut looks like. So sometimes we can't prune back to a lateral branch. What we wanna do is we can prune back to a bud. Now this isn't on branches that are really big and thick. These are generally smaller branches, but you can you want a general rule of pruning about one inch above a bud. So this shows just you know the, the correct way it should look on the left. And then the others are either too far above, too close to the bud, or it's too angled. You don't wanna have it too angled because you can see the where it's too angled, it really goes almost past where the bud is growing out. And that's that branch that that bud is going to turn into um, is going to tear out. It's not gonna have a good union. Does anyone, I'm gonna take a second, does anyone have any questions or anything? All right, so we're gonna go into pruning rules, tools, and approaches to pruning. Um, there's several rules when you're going to be pruning a branch. Know your tree species. We will provide you maps um, that hopefully have the species on them. Um, we're going to be doing something special this year that I'll talk about later, so um, there, there may be a question on this. So um, 
but knowing what species you're going to prune tells you the best time of year to prune. Um, there are proper pruning timings. So pruning late in the dormant season is ideal for most trees, February through early April. It's another reason that um, we target uh, citizen pruner during this time of the year is um, for these smaller trees to give them the best chance. Uh, we're we're pruning really in their strong in the in their deep in their dormancy. Trees that flower in the spring should be pruned immediately after they bloom, except for crab apples. We don't want to prune oaks, elms, or crab apples in the summer. Oaks, we extend that. We stop pruning during oak wilt season, and we'll we'll talk about oak, oak wilt later in the presentation. Um, but those we don't prune from about the middle of March until the beginning of November. And then ideally pruning should begin um, in one year after planting and continue in years three and five. Now, just due to the sheer number of trees that we have, uh, we are not able to meet that mark. We really have to um, laser in on trees that we know have um, issues and we're working to build capacity to try to hit those, those targets. So we're always gonna have a purpose in mind before making a cut. Each cut has the potential to change the growth of the tree. This is really important because we're wounding and opening up an, um, an entry for decay every time we cut a tree. We're going to change the focus of the tree's growth into areas. And we wanna make sure we were focusing that where we want it to go. So making appropriate cuts is really important. We don't wanna do something where we're cutting in such a way it's going to drive the tree to grow into the sidewalk side or you know into the road, things like that. We wanna really be purposeful. The technique, using a proper technique is essential because poor pruning can cause damage that lasts the life of the tree. So think back to those pictures I showed you where they didn't use a tri-cut method and the that it tore all the way down. That tree is not going to recover from that for a very long time. And it's that damage is going to be there for the life of the tree. <clears throat> and then they don't heal the way we do. When a tree, a tree is wounded, it grows over and compartmentalizes the wounds. Small cuts do less harm than larger ones. I'm going to say that again. Small cuts do less harm than larger ones. You know, it sounds obvious, but we want to make sure that we're doing as small a cuts as possible to get what we need done to the tree accomplished. So again, it's another reason that this training pruning on trees that are small is so critical because we're making small cuts that the tree can handle and compartmentalize and grow over now versus letting it get to the point where it's so detrimental to the tree that we can't correct it. And it's really shortened the lifespan of a tree that already probably has a shortened lifespan just because it's growing in the urban environment. We wanna make sure when we're pruning for um, aesthetics and structure that um, it should be done over several years. So if there are a lot of um, branches that need to come off, to get the shape or the look that we're after. Um, we don't wanna do that all at once. We have what we call a one third rule. Remove no more than one third of the live branches at any time. Only because we need to make sure that the tree has enough crown, so enough leaves, to be able to have enough photosynthesis to support the branches and the trunk and the root system. There's gotta be enough crown ratio to the roots to make sure that they can still support those roots. If not, you're going to see a slow decline in the tree until it can get in, there'll be some death in the root systems as they um, retract and support what they can. So only do one third. The obvious difference in this is would be if there was storm damage and we needed to take more and wanted to see if the tree could take it uh, to give it a chance. <clears throat> And then no topping ever on our trees. It's the removal of the very tops of the um, dominant branch to reduce the height and spread. There are ways to do um, crown reduction. Topping is not an appropriate um, way. 
and you really won't need to worry about this in um, the trees that you're pruning, uh, but just understand uh, no topping on any of the trees. <clears throat> Here's why we don't top. Um, it really stresses the trees and causes the lateral buds to come out. Um, and it's they're always poorly attached and very weak. It causes decay uh, in the tops of those because the tree can't close, <clears throat> excuse me, can't close over those wounds properly. And then it creates hazards, which is what we're pruning to avoid to begin with, um, because the new shoots are weakly attached. They grow very quickly and they're prone to break. And quite frankly, topping is ugly. <clears throat> so an approach to pruning, here is some of our citizen pruners out looking at, um, my guess is a park tree. You're gonna start by walking around the tree. Look at it from all sides. Identify any hazardous or potentially hazardous conditions. So um, you're gonna be looking at the tree for that, but you're also gonna be looking around on the ground for that. Is there a big hole? Um, in the in the right of way or you know where we're going to be working is there a hole in the ground that you could trip over when you're working on this tree you need to be looking for that but also when you're looking at the tree are there any hanging branches that could fall at any time are there crossing or rubbing branches is there a big decay pocket you know, are you seeing a big open cavity in the tree <clears throat> you're going to want to look for things like that and then know the species, um, general age. We all know the trees you're gonna be working on are relatively young. And then, you know, the, the natural form. And we're gonna look for, again, those dead and diseased branches, crossing or rubbing branches, poor attached angles. So those V, those V um, connections, we wanna make sure we're addressing those if possible. Co-dominant leaders, we want one strong central leader. If there are any sprouts at the base. So any, uh, you remember that tree that's had the before and the after for the citizen pruners that they pruned had all those sprouts at the base and then branches that pose a safety risk. Again, something low that someone's going to walk into if they're not paying attention. Something that's already broken uh, has obvious signs of issues and then always, again, have that purpose in mind before making a cut. So we're always going to think safety first. Take your time to become familiar with the site and the tree before pruning. Look around. This year, we're not going to be working in the right of way, but when you're working in on um, street trees, you have to be cognizant of the fact that there are going to be vehicles going by, that there might be parked vehicles, there could be people walking by. Make sure you know that you can see there are no branches that are ready to come out, you know, fall down um, and hung up in there that could strike you. Know where the branches are going to fall. Make sure they won't injure you or a fellow citizen pruner or a bystander and damage personal property. All right, I see a hand up. Jamie? Um, I just wanted to say that there are spots where we will be in the right of way just because we don't have enough trees on the uh, housing commission sites. Perfect. Thank you. So do be aware of that. Thank you. Yes. So, okay. We will be working on some city um, on the uh, street trees. So again, yes, vehicles will be going by parked cars, but it's really important. Again, know where your branches are going to fall. Don't be standing underneath when you're making the cuts, stand back into the side. We will be providing pole pruners so you will be able to stand back um, far enough and always make sure your fellow um, pruners are out of the way uh, and that if anyone is walking by and they aren't going to move out of your work zone, um, you absolutely stop making your cuts, wait till they go by and then resume. <clears throat> uh, for um, equipment, we will be providing you all of your safety glasses, leather gloves, hard hats, and a safety vest, all are required to prune the city trees. So if you have your own safety glasses, go ahead and bring them. Otherwise, um, you'll be wearing some of ours. <clears throat> it's really important um, if things fall off, we ask you to stop making the cuts because sometimes when you're looking up, the hard hats when you're wearing a, um, a warm hat underneath 
can slip off, please stop making the cut and put the equipment back on. Um, safety is paramount. <clears throat> so approach to pruning, making the actual cut, we're gonna make sure we use the proper tool, the right tool for the right job. Identify the branch bark ridge and stay, and the um, collar and stay just outside of them. We're gonna make the cut carefully at the right location. So you're just outside of the branch bark ridge and the branch collar at a very slight angle to stay outside of both. <clears throat> Use that three-step pruning method for larger branches. When in doubt, use the three-step method. Make a smooth cut with no jagged edges. So just a firm, smooth pressure, and you'll get to practice this. You're going to prune back to a bud, a parent branch, or a trunk. Remember, we don't want to leave stubs out there. So here's an example. And you could very well see trees in this condition when we're out pruning. We've got broken branches that we're gonna take care of. We're gonna take care of those first. They're broken and could be a hazard. We have codominant stems. It's easy to just clip that, that one on the, the lower one off. We're gonna remove that one. We'll get rid of those suckers. We call these where they grow straight up into the tree instead of out the way the, the rest of the branches are, epicormic sprouts. Those are weakly attached. They're going to um, uh, rub and cause problems for other branches that we'd wanna keep. And then there's crossing branches. We're gonna wanna remove anything that's going to cross and rub. And you can see that that branch has it more of a V look to it than a lot of the others. So we're gonna choose that branch to get rid of instead of the other one above it that's being rubbed on. <clears throat> Once we take care of critical stuff, we'll step back and look, how much of the crown have we removed? Can we continue making pruning cuts on this tree for the aesthetic or do we need to come back and wait? Have we taken enough already? That one third ratio. Benefits of young tree pruning, the growth of the tree. I mean, it, it, when it's properly pruned, when it's young, if you look across the bottom, shows versus the top. The top hasn't been pruned at all. The bottom has been given that young tree training and it promotes and, and prompts the tree and encourages the tree to grow in the way we want it to. <clears throat> that tree is going to have a longer life than the one on the top. So the tools that you're going to be using um, out on the on the job are going to be these these three. You're going to want to select the proper tool for the job. <clears throat> if it's small sprouts, small branches, hand pruners work great. Um, the tools will should be clean and sharp. And then between trees, to prevent um, the spread of disease, we're going to spray the tools with Lysol. We, you can also use rubbing alcohol or a 10% bleach solution, you know, and dip your tool in it at home or something like that. But here we just, we find it um, easier to keep the spray cans of Lysol and we'll spray between cuts, uh, or not, excuse me, not between cuts, between trees. The only time or when you would consider spraying between each cut is if you're working on a tree that you know has a disease and you don't want to spread the disease throughout the rest of the tree. But you'll have hand saws out there and then you'll have pole, what we call pole pruners and pole saws. Um, they have the, uh, the pruning head as well as the saw head that can be used. And those can, you can reach higher up into the tree, but you're still not leaving the ground. We're gonna take some time to talk about some pests uh, that we have concerns about um, in our urban forest. And we we are 10 people on our team of forestry here in the city. And we have close to 50,000 street trees 
Um, and so we can't see and have our eyes on all of the trees. So we rely on residents when they see something weird to call in and let us know. And so here are just a few of the things that we um, are concerned about and would like you guys to keep an eye out for if you ever see um, to reach out. Oak wilt. Oak wilt is a vascular disease. It's transmitted by, um, you guys have heard of um, the picnic beetles, and it also uh, transmits through root grafts from infected oak trees to healthy trees. The trees in the red oak family are most susceptible, and that includes the northern red, uh, pin, black, and scarlet oaks. We can have a healthy 50-inch red oak tree, and it can be dead within six to eight weeks being infected with oak wilt. Once it has it, there's nothing we can do for it. We need to um, go into oak wilt protocol and, and deal with that outbreak. Um, this past year, uh, in August of 2023, oak wilt was found in the Bird Hills Nature Area um, forestry along with our natural uh, natural area preservation team and um, public works staff all came together uh, to work on that and and get it under control. And removals, tree removals um, for that area took place and um, we're moving forward. But it's here in Ann Arbor and we need to be aware and uh, watch out for our oaks. There is less of a concern on our street trees for oak wilt than in our natural areas. Um, they are definite threat to our natural areas versus our street trees simply because of the root grafts. Street trees are like an island to themselves, whereas our forested trees and our natural areas are all root grafted together with other oaks. Beach bark disease. So American beach is affected by this. It's um, up in the Northeastern United States in the Manistee area and in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The trunk is infected, or excuse me, infested by scale insects. And then those scales feed on the trunk, causing small holes that allow a fungus, it's a nectria fungus, to enter the infected tree. Um, and this is causing widespread death to American beech trees. And you can see a healthy trunk versus a trunk with heavy beech scale infestation. I am not aware of anything that's been found down here, but it's something, again, that we're that we're watching out for. Asian longhorn beetle, um, it was found in Chicago and eradicated there. Um, it's been found in Toronto, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and more concerningly, Ohio. It has not been found in Michigan, and I put yet in the par in parentheses there because it's in Ohio and I have, um, we're concerned that it's gonna cross into Michigan. If it does, um, we have big concerns because its favorite preferred species are maple, chestnuts, and bu buckeyes, elms, and willows. We have a lot of those species, um, less on the willows, but a lot of those species in our urban forest. Um, and if it got here, we would we would need to mobilize and, and work with professionals very quickly. Um, to try to eradicate. So keep an eye out for this guy. He's very big. Um, you can see with the ruler there, his body with his legs are an inch wide, but with his antennae, he's three inches wide. So um, very distinctive. If you see him, give us a call. We do have a beetle that looks similar to this, um, but again, even if you see that beetle and you don't know the difference, take a picture, collect the insect, whatever, give me a call. Spotted lanternfly. This was found in Michigan in 2022. Its preferred species is Tree of Heaven. Some people may know it as Alanthus. That's not so much of a concern to us because Alanthus is um, an invasive species and an aggressive invasive species at that. However, it does also go after um, 70 over 70 plant species, including hops and um, obviously is a threat to any hop farmers and others. So uh, spotted lantern fly is, um, we're on the lookout for it. If we see, if you see egg masses and stuff on the trees, it just tear them off. Um, but for sure, we definitely, we don't want this. 
beach leaf disease, our poor beaches. Um, it was found in Michigan in 2022. It affects and kills both the native and ornamental ornamental beech trees. Uh, and then it's it's associated with a nematode. And I'm not going to try to pronounce that nematode name, but it's there for you to read. Um, they don't have a causational link yet. There's, it's so new that they're doing a whole bunch of research on it, but we don't know the full cause and how it spreads. So while there is, it's associated with a nematode, I, we don't know yet for sure that that nematode is spreading it or causing this in some way, but there's concern. So right now, um, again, we're more concerned um, for our natural areas um, with any of those that pass there. Um, our, we don't have a lot of beach. I think we have under 20 beach in our street tree inventory, but we certainly are wanting to be on the lookout for this. So if you're out walking and you see some concerning um, discoloration, let us know. So what to do? What do you do if you see or think you see um, any of these pests or something else you're concerned about? Take a picture or a sample of it, put it in a baggie. Um, note the location. So if you're on a walk, take down the address or if it's not in front of an address, take down the closest um, intersection uh, or closest address um, to where you are. Um, and then if you know it, the type of species or plant that you find it on. Um, if we found it on a tree, let us know. And you know it's a maple, but you don't know what kind of maple. Um, or just a tree. You don't know what type of tree at all. That's fine. Let us know. And then contact me. Um, email, my phone, it's there. Reach out. Um, if you can't remember me, uh, whomever you know at the city. Hey, I found this weird thing on a tree. They'll get you to me. Okay? So let's talk about the Citizen Pruner Program. So volunteer requirements. So the ability to fulfill um, the volunteer tasks as listed, meaning be able to show up and prune the trees, um, commit to participate in at least one workday. So you're coming to the training, but then also we'd like you to commit to at least one of our workdays um, to come and really solidify those skills and help us out um, with the urban forest. Ability to safely use the small hand tools overhead working from the ground. You will never have to leave the ground. There will be no ladders, no bucket trucks, nothing like that. But you do need to be able to lift your arms up and use the tools to prune the branches. There will be pole saws. So um, they extend, I don't know, 10, 16 feet, somewhere in there. They are adjustable um, to help with that work. Ability to lift around 30 pounds. So some of the branches um, that we come down, we drag them off to a staging area. Um, just make sure you're able, you know, you're not on any kind of lifting restriction. Access to transportation. Unfortunately, we don't have, um, you know, a van to be able to go pick up all of our citizen pruner volunteers. So ability to get yourself to the work location. And then, um, we have on our website a volunteer job description um, that, that just talks about all of this in probably greater detail. But that's the requirements. The responsibilities um, to basically follow the rules, work from the ground only, no climbing any of the trees to try to reach something you can't reach or can't get with a pole pruner. That just means that's work that needs to be done by our um, forestry professionals that can use the appropriate equipment. Uh, remove suckers and uh, weeding around the trees. That just means any of those growths from the tree around the tree, um, removing those. Prune the damaged, dead, and diseased limbs. Remove the low branches for clearance. So again, we want to make sure folks can walk on the sidewalk um, without hindrance and that we can get the clearance for the road. Now, some of these trees, we're not going to prune to our normal clearance heights because they're too small yet. So we're just starting that process. We're going to prune for sh um, shape and proper structure. So we want to make sure we're not removing all the branches on one side, leaving it very lopsided. We want to try to make sure that we leave that tree looking as um, nice as possible for the adjacent residents. We're going to um, clean up all of our pruned um, limbs and other debris. 
Now, when we're in the right of way working on street trees, that just means um, piling them up near the tree, near the road. So it's not blocking the sidewalk, it's not blocking the road, but that allows our forestry um, team to come by and uh, easily clean that up after us. Monitor and report tree problems. So you're not gonna be working on every tree you see out there. If you see an issue with a tree, let us know. If you see an issue with a tree you're working on, let us know. Hey, you have us pruning this tree, but I think it's dead, um, that kind of thing. And then assist in updating our street and park tree inventory. So we're going to give you um, maps, um, uh, paper maps. They're gonna be aerial images and there's going to be um, icons on them. And you just cross off the ones you prune and that'll allow us to go back in um, and note and update our inventory. Hey, this tree had its pruning done um, on this day. Or, hey, they noted on here, this tree is dead now. We can uh, we can take care of that and update our, keep our inventory as updated as, as possible. And then educate the public. The importance of um, and techniques of pruning, why it's important to do this, and then promote the Citizen Pruner Program. Get the word out there so we can get more volunteers. Safety and training. So volunteers will receive instructions and information concerning the site and scope of the, the pruning project. It's basically a job briefing at the beginning, at the, at the rally staging point. We'll tell you guys where you're going to be working. You'll be provided maps, um, all the tools and safety equipment you need, and all of that. You'll wear all the appropriate protective equipment that you're provided, and it must be left on. Volun you guys will always be alert and watchful when using the tools. Make sure you're paying attention to where your fellow citizen pruners are. Make sure you're looking around to make uh, that there aren't people wandering into your work zone. Between each cut, when you have a branch on the ground, drag it out from underneath the canopy so you don't trip on it when you're making your next cut. That kind of stuff. And then report any concerns to city staff as soon as possible. Let us know if you have a concern. You have a concern about an, a, you know, a dog that's wandering around. You have a concern about a tree, anything. Doesn't matter what it is. If you have a concern, reach out to us and let us know. You can always skip a tree. If you're at this tree and myself or Jamie or one of our other volunteers, or excuse me, um, staff are helping other volunteers, you can skip that tree and then come back to it when we're available and say, hey, I had a question on this previous tree. Can we go look at it together? We're happy to do that. We cannot undo any cut you make. So if you have questions, ask first. So we've gone over the volunteer responsibilities. We'll talk about staff responsibilities. So we will coordinate the volunteer training and educational support. So that's happening now. It'll happen next week on Saturday in person. We provide technical guidance on pruning and maintenance tasks. Those will happen again at the training and the work days. We organize the citizen pruner work days and we provide all of the safety equipment and tools. And then the contacts, direct contacts for this program are myself, and you can also reach out to Jamie. So let's look at a workday. Typical workday, it's in the, in the morning usually. We meet on site. You will be given um, the location of where we're going to be working, um, usually um, the week before. City staff and advanced citizen pruner volunteers will hand out the pruning assignments. Um, advanced citizen pruner volunteers are those that have been with our program um, for a long time. Uh, they participate every year. Uh, some of them are original back from 2011. You will be given maps um, uh, that list the location of the trees, addresses, species, and other important information. You'll, you will break up or we will break you up into teams of two to four people. We will have a bucket that will have the tools in them. Each team will take a set of tools. You'll also have a clipboard with your map and a permanent marker. So you'll be able to mark as, as you do trees. You'll then prune the trees. 
staff and advanced citizen pruners um, will be around to answer questions. What we do is we sort of bounce between groups, rotate, um, answer questions. You'll um, utilize your experience, utilize your experience and then the experience of other volunteers in the team. New, new uh, pruners, we partner with veteran pruners. Um, you get some great folks. You're gonna meet some good folks and they love what they're doing here. And we hope that you will as well. Pile and prune the branches at the curb for pickup or a designated location. If we're pruning in a park or on a property, we may pick a, a, a specific spot. If we're along the road, then we choose, you know, we, we line it up between the sidewalk and the road, making sure that we are not blocking the sidewalk or the road. You're gonna bring the tools back to the staging area at the end of the workday. So we'll all meet back at the end of the workday, which lasts approximately three hours from 9 a.m. until noon. And you'll turn those tools and all of your safety equipment, um, the clipboards and the sheets that you filled out back in. And then, you know, you, you go on your way and forestry um, usually stays, if we have forestry on staff, on staff that day, um, cleans it up. If not, they come in on Monday and we'll clean up um, the debris. So weather, inclement weather is a thing. Um, we've been seeing it lately in the last few years. It may impact the workdays. If there is a winter weather advisory or a winter storm watch or warning, staff will cancel the workday. In the event we must cancel, we will call each volunteer to notify them the event is canceled. So please make sure that you have provided your cell phone information to me or Jamie. We don't share it. We don't publish it. It is strictly used to contact you in case for whatever reason we have to cancel. Dress in layers. Hand and foot warmers are a good idea. We have been working in 40 degrees where you don't need snow pants and we've worked when the wind was just disgusting and gross and it was negative whatever out. Um, we don't cancel because it's cold. The We will cancel if there is a wind chill advisory. If it's dangerous to be working out there, we will cancel. But please know, dress in layers. You can always take stuff off if you want. And then, of course, if you get uncomfortable, we have had this happen where they're, they've dressed warmly, but they're still cold and they're not able to stay for the full time. You know yourself. Leave when you need to leave. Um, it is not, you're not looked down upon. It is not a negative to, to have to leave early. So, um, take that into account and, um, do what you need to do. So other opportunities, um, with the city and citizen pruner, there is a program called eyes on the forest out of Michigan state university extension and volunteers essentially adopt, um, sentinel tree and periodically monitor it and provide updates on its condition to Michigan State University Extension. So you can reach out to MSU um, and uh, to sign up for this program. There's a training that you go through and then they, I don't know if they assign you a tree or you select a large tree, um, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting program. We do have several volunteers that participate. And then something that's outside of the citizen pruner, but still in the same vein of, of tree care, we have the 10,000 trees initiative. The Office of Sustainability and Innovation set a goal of seeing 10,000 new trees planted on private property in the city by the year 2030. Um, it's through that program that the city and groups of volunteers gather and plant trees in neighborhoods, apartment complexes, or other communities at no cost to the adjacent resident. If you are interested in potentially participating in a planting program, please reach out to Sean Reynolds. He's a senior analyst and um, heads up the city's 10,000 trees initiative. And I've put his contact information there, um, his email, uh, if you are interested. We do also do giveaways of seedlings that he's always looking for volunteers for as well. 
So here is our workday schedule. So our field training day is going to be next weekend, February 3rd, from 9 a.m. until about 11 a.m. Our workday one is going to be February 17th. That's a Saturday. And those days are three hours from 9 to 12. Workday two is going to be on a Sunday, March 3rd, from 9 to 12. And then workday three will be March 16th, from 9 to 12. And this year is exciting because we are partnering with the Housing Commission. All work is going to take place at Housing Commission properties or directly adjacent to them. So as Jamie said, if there aren't enough um, trees on the property themselves, we will move into the streets surrounding them. So um, this work is really important. Um, you know, the Housing Commission provides a great benefit to uh, residents, low-income residents, and to be able to help them out and prune trees that they don't have budget for is awesome. So we're really excited to have that happen this year and hope that you guys will be excited about that too. So what's next? Our outdoor instruction and hands-on practice, again, February 3rd, next weekend. The location is gonna be um, Lori Terrace Housing Commission property. So that's boxed in yellow there. It's off of Huron, West Huron Street. However, we cannot park there. Um, the, the parking is for residents on there and it's already a tight, tight fit and parking is an issue for them. So we are going to park at West Park, boxed in red. And we will either just walk through the park there or walk along Chapin Street to get there. But we are going to all meet at West Park there, boxed in red. And then you will sign up and join us for work days. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, Rainy. Oops, this is really unrelated to the presentation, mm -hmm. but our neighborhood is filled with those little gray um, braces at the base of the tree. Mm -hmm. And there's never been any instructions provided. So people, um, like the bottom of the tree can be really ratty or bulging or decaying because the dog pee and whatnot is trapped behind it. And I was curious what, you know, what was the purpose of them and when should they be removed? Um, things like that. Yeah. So I think you're talking about the trunk guards, the small, like, yeah. yay big, the trunk guard. Yeah. yeah. Those are put on um, after the tree is planted. Um, forestry comes by and puts those on when we're inspecting the planting. Um, those are there to protect from the mowers and the weed string trimmers because we see extensive damage um, from mowing, um, hitting mowers, hitting the tree, and then the string trimmers, especially. So those are put on there. We don't close them like they're left loose. So as the tree grows, they'll open um, because we don't, we can't get back to take them off um, or adjust a size on them. Adjacent residents, if you want to, to pull it off, um, you can. So long as we just ask you take care then with your string trimmers um, and your mowers, around the tree. Okay, that's good because I think a lot of people are unclear. And then I've seen like this beautiful red oak was probably six to 10 years old, very tall, but the bottom, the the cambrium was just chewed up. Like somebody hadn't removed it. So it died from the tree guard. Hmm. But it's good to know that people just need to guard the trunk. That's the main purpose of it. Yes. Okay. And we leave Thank it open. You. I'm surprised it grew in because it, it's, um. I've seen them and they just, they don't latch. And so they just open up. Yeah. that's. So, I think that's... people see the braces and then they decide, oh, it's supposed to lock because they don't know the purpose. They, they close it. Okay. Yeah. I hadn't seen that yet. So, okay. um, but yeah, absolutely. Adjacent residents can, um, can uh, monitor and take off and put those on as they need. Um, but yes, we do it because of the extensive, extensive spring trimmer damage. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Of Perhaps course. I should add that to our tree planting cards when we put out our trees. 
just explaining what those things are. That would be great. Or, uh, you know, if somebody posted a public information on next door, that would just be, you know, we've received questions. This is the purpose, either protect the trunk from mowing or make sure the tree guard is expanding, but don't let it choke the, the trunk. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I had a question about the in-person training. So um, I'll be attending on behalf of NAP, do I need to bring the tools that we have to that training? Yes. So um, if you talk to Tina, um, I think she should know where all that's stored. And then so you would, um, you're going to be printing out the maps. Jamie will send you the maps for that day. <clears throat> and then you'll bring all the clipboards and the markers and the all the equipment. Okay, great. I'll um, be sure to get more specifics from Tina next week. Great. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you all for attending. Um, again, we'll hopefully see you next week and from there at our work days. I appreciate you all taking the time and volunteering with us um, to help take care of our urban forest. Thank you Thanks, very Tiffany. Much. That was great. Yep. Thank, you, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.